Good morning, everybody. Wonderful to see everybody. And I can truly say see because this is being run as a Zoom meeting. So this is completely different uh, from our last uh, month uh, convenings over the last two months. Uh, welcome to convening the big collection um, in this morning. Uh, we are running this as a meeting. I'm gonna start the uh, presentation in just a second. The first half of this session uh, is going to be a presentation. I'll be uh, talking through a few slides and the second half is gonna be Zoom breakout rooms. Um, and I'll talk more about that and how we're gonna do that. But this is a, a, a new uh, element in our monthly convenings and bringing in a different uh, aspect of Zoom, which is the one we're all uh, quite familiar with, of course, we're doing the webinars in the previous months and the meeting uh, in this month. So this is our first session of conversation. Um, and uh, one of the things that we're gonna discover is how many people uh, show up for the, today's convening. And it's gonna be wonderful because we're all gonna get a chance to see each other and meet each other. So let me get started um, with the presentation. Uh, uh, many more will join us as we go and that is uh, just perfect. So uh, let me go ahead and start my screen share here. Just one moment. Okay, so this morning's session, um, and this is a pivot. We, uh, as I sent out in the email last week, um, our theme for this morning uh, was about trust and about networks of trust. Uh, we've made a pivot to the path to community action, how the big collection will work and how to get involved. I also think of this as the you are here uh, kind of moment. Um, so uh, as we're taking this pivot, um, there's a few things uh, that I wanted to take note for uh, it, for this morning, just for housekeeping. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about the change in topic and the pivot that we've made here uh, to take up, um, especially bring focus to this, how the big collection will work and how to get involved. Uh, but first, a couple of things of housekeeping. Uh, as I mentioned, today is being run as a Zoom meeting. Um, please keep your mics muted for during the first half. The second half, we're gonna use breakout rooms. Um, there's also going to be a, a bit of an open Q&A with all of us, uh, which we'll get to. Uh, so during that, of course, uh, we'll talk more about that, but you can unmute your mics and so forth. Uh, and especially during the breakouts is when we're all talking to each other. Uh, but for this first session, if you could keep your mics muted. Um, and then uh, if you volunteered to be a host and you know who you are, a host for the breakout rooms, uh, if you could rename yourself and put a star in front of your name. Um, and all of the uh, Big Ten Academic Alliance staff, the facilitators, uh, if you could put two stars in front of your name, this is how we're gonna identify everybody. Um, during this first portion, uh, um, we're gonna be doing, uh, creating the breakout rooms. And that, so that's especially why the stars in front of the names uh, are very helpful so we can find everybody. Uh, if you need technical support, again, as always, uh, contact library.support at btaa.org. Um, also in uh, the chat, uh, but as, uh, that going to that email support is very reliable. Um, the session is uh, captioned during this first portion. Uh, you can get to that by clicking the, the live caption icon at the bottom of your screen. <clears throat> um, and we'll be recording the opening presentation only, uh, not the breakouts. I'll talk more about that, but we will be recording the opening uh, presentation and we'll post it after the session. Um, but out of respect for your peers, please don't record the session yourself or take screen captures to post publicly. And as a final note, <clears throat> very importantly, uh, the BTAA library community welcomes contributions of all of our colleagues and is respectful of and open to different opinions, viewpoints, experiences, and backgrounds. So please be respectful of our community's diversity and generous of other people's views. This is import especially important as we introduce this new dynamic of conversation uh, for our monthly meetings. I do wanna start this morning with gratitude, especially, um, and I'm particularly grateful for all of my colleagues this morning, um, putting on a, this different aspect and bringing the meeting aspect requires an enormous amount of knowledge and technical skill. And so many people have come together uh, to bring this and make this possible this morning. Extremely grateful um, for all of the people who have uh, brought so much to this morning and all my colleagues who are here in the Zoom um, and will be managing the show today. Uh, speaking of Zoom, I'm incredibly grateful for Zoom as well. 
Um, and it uh, is some, become so much a part of all of our lives. Uh, and yet one thing that I am especially cognizant of this morning um, is that we can all look at each other face to face. Uh, in what kind of world could we previously have had um, tens, dozens, hundreds of us get together in a room and all actually look at each other. Um, it's so rare and such a privilege to be able to do this together. Um, I'm also really grateful for this community. Uh, I, I say this often, but for uh, the time to adapt, for all of the wonderful thinking, for the questions you send in, uh, for all of the engagement, this is just a truly incredible community. And having this opportunity to do the, our monthly big convenings in this way, uh, where we get to listen what, to what's coming in, to adapt, to change course, and to take up a new direction um, is truly wonderful. Uh, so I want to start with that gratitude and place it at the center um, and to uh, take that moment to say, we're pausing to reflect this morning. This morning, um, In the feedback, uh, the questions that have come in over the first two monthly convenings, we've clearly heard this emergent topic on people's minds. Um, how is this going to work? You know, how do I get involved and contribute? Um, and what is this all gonna mean for me? So this really important uh, goal for the big collection is to build a system that's responsive to our needs rather than reactive. So for this session in May, uh, it makes really good sense to pause and consider this most important question of how are things going to work? So today is geared towards conversation. Uh, and we think it's gonna work in the following way. So for the first portion, as I mentioned, I'm doing the presentation, we're gonna move into the conversations. Um, and the value of today is really in sharing thoughts, uh, sharing our ideas, and that's going to help guide and shape things. So we're really moving into the real spirit of the big collection, which is that it's based in community conversation. All voices are included. Uh, and this is how we're going to create this path going forward to create the future of the big collection. So today is really about uh, trying to model our ability to pivot and adapt. Um, and this is learning on the fly also. So we're gonna just roll with the morning um, and we're gonna have a fantastic session. So here we go. Um, what I wanna do first is to say that this morning is really about building on Kathleen Fitzpatrick's uh, presentation at the last convening on collection, collective action um, and the common good. Uh, it's so incredibly important to recognize that the wisdom that we need to do the big collection lives in our community. Uh, it's our collective knowledge and how do we tap into it? So one thing that Kathleen pointed out is that there are incredible barriers to collective action. Um, our universities are built on competition uh, and the legacy of competition is really something, as Qu Kathleen pointed out too, that we have to consciously take on and that we have to work uh, actively uh, to overcome this competition as the driver for excellence in the academy. And as Kathleen uh, so elegantly pointed out, it's really about shifting to collaboration as the new driver for excellence. Um, once we take up uh, the question of the barriers to collaboration, what are those? There are those inherent in the academy. I pointed to this also earlier, you've seen the slide, but uh, the instabilities that we face in our broader environment. So there's not just the barriers in the academy, but they're all around us. Things like cost, the climate uh, crisis, the public health crisis, like this is all around us. The news um, on the pandemic, incredibly encouraging this week in some instances and in others, incredibly disheartening, like the outbreak um, in India. And it just continually evolves around us. Uh, things like infrastructure collapse, social unrest and political upheaval, all of these are around us. And we have to ask this question we place at the center, these are risks surrounding us, but what is the risk of inaction? And this is what we really face when we pick up and look at the path that we need to go down. So I wanna take a moment to look at this question of the risk of inaction. So if we're to look at what if we did nothing, what would happen? What if we were to say, sit here and watch the world pass by, which none of us would do, but the risks of inaction uh, to the academy, to our pathway, 
is an incredible imbalance between academy owned and commercial infrastructure. And Kathleen talked about this deeply. Um, this is one of the things in creating a knowledge commons that we have to actively uh, move into it and oppose the privatization of public knowledge and bring a different gesture. Um, we would also be at great risk of siloed behavior in a networked and interdependent world. So a loss of our national and international competitiveness, uh, which is incredibly important for us um, as we try to look at the pathway that we're carving out. Um, also an incredible increase in waste and redundancy. Um, and this is one of the things about collective action. We join together to avoid that waste and redundancy. Um, an inability to serve as effective stewards of the scholarly and cultural record, uh, that is uh, just an incredibly uh, disheartening thing as libraries, it's just the core of our mission. And we would see increasing rising impediments to creating, sharing and adapting knowledge, um, the sort of leading to a scientific and cultural stagnation. And who would want any of this, right? This is terrible. So we are called to action. And it is our perception, our perception of the opportunities, not only the barriers that face us, but the opportunities when we start to come together in collective action, that this is the pathway to build resilience against an uncertain future. It's our perception of the future, our love for the ideal of what we're creating that can start converting barriers to collective action into opportunities. Uh, so this is where we will sit today uh, and, and is the, will form the heart of our pathway forward is moving from a scarcity orientation into an abundance orientation. That all of these constraints, if we bring perception to them and see our pathway, will convert from scarcity and constraint into abundance. And I just wanna pause here and note that we're gonna start arranging uh, the breakout rooms in the background here. Um, so we're preparing for later in the session, we're, we're going to break out um, into the conversations. So this is our for action, we must act. And the question we bring to it is, how are we going to bring our intentions and plans into action? Um, and moreover, how do we bring complex intentions at grand scale into action? This is building the knowledge commons for the big 10. This is the action we are called towards. So I wanna step back a little bit and say, as we head out on this pathway uh, to provide a little bit of orientation, and this is sort of this uh, heart of the morning is the you are here uh, kind of moment. So uh, by way of orientation, uh, and we're gonna take something that we all know very well. Um, and this is HathiTrust, the example of HathiTrust. Uh, it has come to incredible aid for all of us, for our students, for our scholars, uh, in the midst of this pandemic. So just to step back towards the, the timeline of HathiTrust and how we got to where we are today, uh, the scanning, and this was 2004, uh, there was much scanning going on before this, we were all scanning uh, books, but the real at scale scanning uh, started in 2004. This was the announcement of the Google partnership and the Google uh, Books project to start scanning books at massive scale. Uh, and then in 2008, HathiTrust itself was announced, uh, this tremendous digital library um, to hold uh, in trust for the community, uh, all of that uh, scanning of our printed material. Um, and then in 2020, the pandemic hit. And all of a sudden, this wonderful resource that had been created, it started back in 2004 with the mass scanning, uh, in 2008 had been announced, it was ready, you know, and who could have imagined back in 2004, 2008, that we would be creating something that there would be a pandemic one day and Hathi Trust would emerge and open up, be able to open up access as all of our stacks closes, all of our libraries closed, open up the digital surrogates of all of these and continue to provide um, this uh, tremendous collection to all of our faculty and students. Uh, it was simply ready. So one thing that, that I want to point out here is with Hathi Trust, this durability of intention and ideals uh, over a long period of time. And to set that as the context, and we'll step back a little bit and expand the timeline. 
so as we talk about the big collection and where we stand today, so I'll keep Hathi Trust up at the top there, and we've got the UR here line in 2021. So uh, back in 1961, to take us all the way back, the CIC was founded. This is later going to become the BTAA, uh, but this is the Center for in uh, uh, Institutional Committee for Institutional Cooperation, pardon me. Um, in 1964, only three years after the CIC was formed, uh, this remarkable report was written, which uh, Suzanne found for me uh, in a typescript. It's 12 pages long. It's called Some Observations on the Possibilities of Instituting Cooperative Automated Systems Among CIC Libraries. Uh, this, as a certain way you could say, this was like the seed of the big collection. What if we could share? Uh, our total collection was 18 million volumes at that time. Then uh, let's go forward a few decades to 1993, the Virtual Electronic Library. And there are many of us that remember uh, the VEL, its aspirations to create uh, resource sharing um, and unified access across all of our universities. Uh, 58 million volumes was the size of our physical collection at that time. And there's a little snapshot of the uh, CIC Virtual Library taking shape, the press release uh, for that. Um, it didn't quite work out as we imagined, but in a certain way was building on this vision from 1964. And it was reappearing in the 1990s and it didn't quite make it, uh, but time continued to move on. And then in 2019, several decades more, and while this is going on, by the way, that scanning and uh, in the, in the Hathi Trust Digital Library is starting up, um, the big collection visioning started in 2019 a wonderful report in collaboration with OCLC, um, operationalizing the big collection was the touchstone that was in August of 2019. That September, a signed letter, all 15 library deans committing to an inter interdependent future uh, for the big 10 uh, academic alliance for our libraries. Um, and then a bunch of stuff proceeded through that visioning stage. Uh, what, are, what were the, uh, the dean's goals, the library director's goals? What uh, this wonderful matrix, we form committees to work to uh, say, what are these goals? What are we trying to form? What is it that we're talking about anyway? Uh, went into uh, later in 2020, forming the project structure and drawings and, and how is all of this going to work? Um, and so we got a lot of um, knowledge uh, built around, and this was sort of a quiet phase as all of this was being created. What is this going to look like? And then in 2021, and in the midst of that, right, in 2020, all of that was going on as the pandemic hit and we were doing all that work. And where we are today is bringing the big collection into action. And that's what these monthly convenings are standing uh, in parallel and working alongside with how do we bring the big collection into action. So uh, I want to take just a moment to look uh, what is it that got created there during that silent phase where we were doing all of this work on the visioning? Um, so uh, a project structure. So there's the library directors, uh, the initiative sponsors setting the vision and direction and holding the commitment to the big collection. We created a steering committee, the big collection steering committee uh, responsible for stewarding the strategic roadmap. And I'm gonna talk about the roadmap, allocating resources and aligning policies. This is, uh, uh, incredibly important to bring the resources necessary to create the big collection. And this is one of the things that lies, uh, it's embedded in that commitment letter that we'll bring the resources, the services, everything that is necessary to create the big collection. Um, and then where we are right now is this question, creating the big collection pilots. And we're gonna talk a lot about the pilots uh, in just a moment. Um, but creating practical projects, articulating objectives, and stewarding the resources, reporting on the outcomes, what works, what is moving forward. Um, and this also establishing the strategic areas of focus. So this is another question, working at tremendous scale, at enormous scale on a very complex project, where do we start? Uh, and this is creating a knowledge commons for the big 10. What's the core? It's starting with the infrastructure. Um, so those are four uh, key areas of focus in these first couple of years. Um, discovery, which is the total pool of resources across all 15 research libraries. Delivery, rapidly, anywhere, regardless of who owns or where it is, regardless of the formats it, it, that it's in. 
Um, knowledge creation, this is really the scholarly communication uh, pillar, radically expanding publishing opportunities, advancing open scholarship and prioritizing freedom of choice, and then knowledge preservation as that fourth area of focus. Um, durable, scalable, open, and trustworthy. Uh, and, and on this are the uh, year one priorities for the functional pilots that we'll create. Um, and uh, you can read them there, they'll be in the slides, but things like large scale bibliographic access to the collections, large scale analysis of the collections, uh, development and provisioning of distinctive and shared collections, uh, enhanced delivery systems and common policies and platforms. These four the five lead priorities that will uh, speak to those strategic areas of focus. So this is all functional, right? This is all things that were created. Um, and where we uh, really want to say is that as Kathleen pointed out, um, there is a path of competition. Uh, where we are choosing to go is the path of collaboration. It's a path of innovation and it's a path of emergence. Uh, it was one that will incorporate the voices of community, uh, the voices of the community, our voices all together, uh, the voices of the institutions and the voices of individuals. And this is the conversation we're preparing for today, uh, sweeping in the voices, all of your voices, sweeping in the voices of the community. So I wanna especially focus on the voices of the institutions um, and how that works. Uh, and this is where we draw it all out. This is actually a dynamic and living process. So um, working with uh, each voices coming from this direction, I'm gonna follow that voices of the institutions. Uh, we've been shaping an imagination for how things will work. Uh, today, I'd like to invite all of you into that imagination. We are tapping into the community from which this will grow. Uh, and we're building a variety of ways for people to do that. And we're gonna talk about those variety of ways in, in the voices of the community, the voices of individuals. Uh, I'm especially wanna point here for a few minutes to the voices of the institutions and then invite some questions uh, before we go into our breakout rooms um, to really pick up uh, the importance uh, and the central conversation. As we go into this, uh, just a quote from Albert Einstein, imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. So we're gonna step into the imagination. Um, and you've seen me put up uh, this slide before of the innovation model. So this is where we start to take this step into imagination. And we can look at this uh, wonderful picture and say, well, how does that work? So it's a different model than what we're used to. It's a different model than what we see in a lot of our universities, for example, or in our everyday life, but how does that actually work? Um, so this, this spiral of risk and innovation, consolidating the gains, keeping what works, setting aside what doesn't, and then doing a new round of investment and consolidating the gains for that, reaching further, deepening our capacities and reaching further. So um, how is that gonna work? I wanna step to my uh, picture of the continents, right? this graphic. Uh, another thing that we've looked at before and to say, how does this actually work? Um, so uh, we could imagine these pilots being seated on various areas of these continents. So these continents, the purchase collection, the license collection, our published collection through our presses, our digitized collection, all of our digital, rich digital collections we're creating, uh, data sets and so forth. Um, let's take fulfillment as an example in the purchase collection. Our fulfillment network you borrow right now is limited to physical items. Um, and there's an inequity of service. Uh, on, and we have a huge geographic reach. Um, all the way from Nebraska out to New Jersey and Maryland. Um, some uh, areas get much faster service, others are much slower. Um, so what uh, we can start there is the pilots for seeing how do we introduce that equity of service? How do we expand the amount and the capabilities with physical items? We could do a couple of more pilots there in the purchase collection. Um, and then over in the license collection, this becomes a huge question in the pandemic world, all of that digital content that we're licensing, how do we share that, right? So when you have a physical uh, network that's oriented towards physical borrowing, clearly you have an enormous problem in a pandemic right now uh, with the digital items. So can we introduce digital items um, into those workflows? 
uh, and we can start a little more. And as we're sort of thinking about this as continents, as a little pilot starting up different parts of these continents and explorations beginning, um, where do they all start to meet up? Down in the published collection, for instance, is there universal access to our eBooks for, uh, for the Big Ten, much less our other university presses? And a little bit of a connection over from that continent of the published collection to the licensed collection. And we have new pilots starting up the digitized collection, these connecting with each other, and all of a sudden prepared something over in the presses you know, that it could connect to from the digitized collection. Uh, and all the way down to this wonderful content of uh, a continent of open access, um, which we have wonderful conver uh, uh, conversations, of course, about whether that's a continent, uh, whether it's actually blended with the others, how it works, um, if it should be something that stands on it, its own. And we can start to see each of these connecting to each other. The bridges start, um, the, the connections between each one of these continents. And something amazing starts to happen here. Um, as they bridge together, the continents actually start to move. This starts to join together, not separate islands, not separate continents, but one as the big collection. Uh, and something very important happens here because this question comes up of what about the unique and the distinctive collections? Um, every one of these, you could almost imagine them, maybe not as islands, perhaps as glaciers of these magnificent, as we know of a glacier that it has a beautiful, uh, element above the water that we can see, but grows and becomes so much larger and richer underneath the water. And each one of our institutions, as it's, we're able to create this uh, central continent of the big collection, um, able to focus on individual, on unique, on distinctive collections, and uh, creating these magnificent and, and uh, quite uh, important research collections, because we are research libraries, driving down deep to the local needs of our students, uh, faculty, researchers, of all of our scholars. So what holds all of this together? Are we just randomly exploring this continent and how we create it together? How do we know that something is happening up in the continent of the purchase collection that connects to the license collection? Something's going over on in, in data. How do you share a data set, right? How is that, uh, can we make that possible? Um, and this is where it becomes uh, key importance is the roadmap. We need a map, right? How do we create the map that tells us what's happening in all of the different parts, keeps them coordinated uh, and creates a common knowledge of what's happening, something that we all can see. Um, so I wanna just point towards a couple elements on the roadmap. Um, and this is a real thing, by the way. Um, and if I have a second here, I'll show you, I have it over in, um, a Miro board, uh, where if you remember all of the different reports, um, the committees that did work, the various things that happened in that timeline of how we got to where we are today, all of those things created documents upon documents and all sorts of observations. And we, what we've done is taken them all and spread them out onto the roadmap so that we can see all of the parts of it. So what we have here is a framework uh, that has come from all of the work before uh, where we're standing today. The pathway we're taking forward is one of community action and community involvement and in our collective voices. We have a framework. We're going to fill it in by inviting all of the community into that to help fill it out because it doesn't become anything if it stays as a frame. It needs all of us to join in and pick it up together. So this uh, element of the roadmap, the now, soon, and later, uh, as we looked at a timeline earlier, we're sitting very much in time, year by year by year, in this flow of time towards where we are today. <clears throat> where we stand today expands out uh, into an unknown future. We're actively shaping it. It doesn't exist yet. And so we start to create, we step out of the time stream for a second and say, now, soon and later, towards what's the desired future that we're creating, that future of the knowledge commons for the Big Ten Academic Alliance. Um, and as we start to somewhat like all of the different continents, um, all of these different roadmaps for scholarly communication, for collection development, for fulfillment, discovery, uh, all of the, how we, the commitments and agreements that we make with each other. And at the center of that for our lead priorities of where we start with are those four areas, discovery, delivery, knowledge creation and knowledge preservation. Those areas of focus will change and adapt as we go forward. We'll achieve some infrastructure in those areas 
and we'll say we're ready to move on to new, say maybe for two years or so, we'd work in these uh, key areas of focus and then be able to establish new areas of focus and new areas where uh, we can seed pilots. Uh, as we take those original pilots, we turn them into infrastructure, we take investments and we take them out to scale. And then we start to see new pilots uh, and new areas of focus and build those out as well. Um, this is an undertaking of incredible complexity uh, and it's truly massive. And it needs a steady hand, it needs uh, an intention uh, and it needs a systemic and a deliberate focus. Uh, there are tools for doing this and how we design this roadmap together. So um, I want to stop there. I've been talking for about half an hour uh, and we'll do about um, 10 minutes of, uh, uh, oh, by the way, you saw the flowers grow here, right? This is back to that picture of the continents and little pilots that got seeded on the various continents. Those spread out to the roadmap now so that we can see all of this. We can see the progress that's made uh, and we can all have visibility into how this works, what's been achieved, what we've set aside, uh, and where we do, where we take uh, the next steps. Uh, so I'm going to unshare my screen now and go to a Q and A for about ten minutes that we'll all do together. Um, and then uh, after that ten minutes, uh, I'm going to check in um, with uh, Suzanne and all of our folks managing uh, this in the background to see if we're ready. I'm gonna just in our last 10 minutes, um, bring us back together um, and sort of with some uh, concluding thoughts. Um, and as I do, uh, as I do, I always have a, I always have a slide. So um, I'm just gonna uh, share my, a couple of screens here. Um, and in our last 10 minutes, uh, talk about where we go with this, because this is incredibly important is what we build on from today. Um, and I, I, the couple of the comments here were so great. Is like one of the small groups, uh, really great. So much good conversation there. Also, maybe too short, um, you know. And uh, we all had different experiences. So I just want to point: it's like we all just went through an experience together as a community, a community conversation. Um, and out of that, uh, and the hope for this morning. Um, and I, and I, uh, this is what I hope is the seed of the conversation. This was about learning, it was about connection and about new colleagues. And I heard a, a few of the, like some really great ideas came out of the conversations you had. Um, and those ideas are what we wanna sweep in and your perspectives, things you didn't get to say, um, things you heard that were really great, things that other people shared, because this is really the heart of this is um, this approach through community, this uh, systemic approach, this sort of sweeping in is about um, saying, you know, I have an idea. What's your idea? You know, I care about you. I care about what you need from me. I care about when you need it. And I want to hear more about it. And that's where we're going is to sweep all this in because this is us. We're the community to create this. You know, we're together as a community in this. So um, <clears throat> as uh, you leave here, and this is the next step is where we carry this, because um, this uh, time that we have together in a Zoom room like this uh, is very precious, right? How many times do we get just us meet people from other different places, from other backgrounds, people we've never talked to before? Great things emerge out of that. So that's where we're going as the next step after the session please carry your ideas into the wind tunnel. I'm gonna describe for you briefly wind tunneling. This is an online environment uh, and there's gonna be, we'll have it all set up for you um, and you can go in and it's for capturing ideas, capturing insights. You can see what everybody else is saying. It's a completely anonymous environment. Um, so you can, as the ideas emerge and get added, you can see what other people are saying. You can add to it. Uh, you can build on the thoughts. We're going to send you a link to go into the wind tunnel. Um, and this is going to build the community knowledge. It's the Center for Community Knowledge and Conversation. Um, your thoughts, what you create in the wind tunnel, what this community creates together are gonna to inform the university librarians. It's going to inform the big collection steering committee. It's going to inform the BTA staff. It's going to inform, help you inform each other 
It's how we all start listening to each other. And it's out of that community conversation, out of the ideas that we create together, that the shape of all of this is going to uh, come together. Um, there was an incredibly good point earlier uh, about where are <clears throat> all of the faculty, the students, the users, our researchers, et cetera. Um, this is the way that we join in our voices. The similar gesture is how we're going to join in all the voices um, of all of our faculty and students, hundreds of thousands of strong, so that we can start to see the patterns, uh, so that we can start to see what's emerging, so that we can start to see what's most important and what we bring attention to. Um, so as we conclude here, and I've seen a couple more great comments in um, the chat, um, <clears throat> by way of input, by way of your ideas and things, please, carry these into the wind tunnel because we'll see everything there. We'll all be sharing there um, together. So I, I wanna conclude today um, with a thought because it's in the joining of these ideas that we start to perceive, uh, that we start to see what lives in each one of us and more importantly, broadly, what lives in us as a community and to bring attention to that. Um, so I'm going to just uh, conclude with a thought here um, from Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, and Emerson was talking about instinct and perception. This was a, a, his last lecture a series that he gave at Harvard University in 1871. And this was his lecture on instinct and perception. And he said, when the perception becomes active, when we listen to that voice within and begin to see in a different way, all of the barriers around us, where was a wall is now a door. The gates, once opened, never swing back. So this is an invitation <clears throat> to this community and their voices. And as it expands, once we open these gates, they will never swing back. This is our path forward. It's the direction we will take.